It's one of the greenest countries on Earth, an El Dorado of river and forest where the possibilities seem endless. Suriname in the Amazon is one of the last frontiers and a land of illegal gold panners. For nature lovers, this little country is a gold mine of biodiversity in the image of its extremely mixed population. <laughs> in the heart of the Amazon, pirug or airplane are the only ways to plunge deep into this endless forest tinged with adventure. The Amazon is a boundless universe. It never ends. There is always something further ahead. You advance and it keeps on going. Fabian Vaz is a Buru, a white descendant of Suriname's original Dutch colonists. He has decided to capture the beauty of his little known country. My job is traveling the length and breadth of Suriname to fix the country's most beautiful sites on film. Foreigners don't even know where Suriname is. It's located on the northern coast of South America between Guyana, French Guiana, and Brazil. Traveling in Suriname is always an expedition. The infrastructure is poor and there are hardly any roads. You have to use the rivers to get around. That's why traveling here is always full of surprises. And it makes the country interesting. This is a land of adventure. Fabian loves the wilderness and exploring unknown territories, photography, and the people he meets in his life. He has made a name for himself in this little country, flanked by the Amazon on one side and the warm waters of the Atlantic Ocean on the other. When you're a stranger and you enter a village, the most important thing to do is be respectful. Before I start shooting in the village, I have to go see the chief. I have to thank him for allowing me to photograph the village and the villagers. You have to respect the people, explain to them exactly what you're going to do, and be polite. It's normal. You're on their territory. For Fabian, his adventure in photography is like a rebirth. In a few months, he'll be publishing his work, 12 photos to the glory of Suriname. His photo reportage begins with the Amerindian fishermen of Galibi, then plunges into the limitless forest where the young photographer's life nearly hit bottom. I was panning for gold out in the forest for three years. I needed money. It was a great experience, but I was always in danger. It was really quite something. I wouldn't sleep. I'd be there in my hammock, afraid of being attacked. I was living in an encampment, in a tent, a canvas tarp that could be set up very quickly, and just a plastic sheet to protect me from the wind and rain. That was my shelter. Everything was dirty, polluted. I was eating poorly, drinking bad water. It was really not a healthy life.
One day, there was a police raid. When the police came into the camp, I grabbed all my stuff, my papers, and ran off into the forest. I was in such a bad state that I broke down and cried. That was a decisive moment. I knew I couldn't go on with that way of life. I was afraid the police would catch me and lock me away. That's when I realized that it just wasn't worth the trouble. It was momentous, a staggering moment, even now when I think back on it. It was a very emotional moment, even now as I think Gashes in the brown earth, polluted with mercury. This is the El Dorado of the illegal gold panners. Fabian is a born-again ecologist who's now paying off his debt to nature. When I look back on my life before, what I did then, and what I'm doing now, I feel good. I'm a better person and feel better about my life. I've done some shady things in the past. Now, with my photography, it's a whole new ball game. I'm out in the forest, in the middle of the trees and the people. It's just all positive energy. I feel it's my place. Fabian is traveling up the Suriname River, one of the main arteries into the interior. It hasn't rained in weeks. Bad news for the boatmen. In the dry season, the inland villages are even more isolated from the rest of the world by the rapids. I love traveling like this, with no roads to get from one point to another. When you leave the city, you have to drive on dirt tracks. Then you have to take a pirogue for several hours and cross the rapids. When the river's low, you have to push the pirogue, help the boatmen through the rapids. Sometimes you even have to carry the pirogue when it's really low. This is the land of the Maroons, the descendants of slaves that ran away from the plantations more than 200 years ago during the colonial period. The Maroons learned a lot from the Indians about surviving and adapting here. Now they have their own way of life. This is a traditional gateway designed to ward off evil spirits. There must be a village close by. Hello, ma'am. How are you? Fine, thanks. I'm looking for the person who makes pirogues. You have to go back towards the river. Is it far? Yeah. 
Ay, vamos a echar a mi They told me that there was a boat builder here. Yes, right here. It's me. I'm a photographer. Would it be okay if I take some pictures? Yeah, yeah, sure. No problem. Okay. What's the next stage in the construction? Um, no, well, once I've finished hollowing out the trunk, I'm going to burn it, heat it up gently, and then I'll lay some palm fronds underneath it, then light them. After that, I have to wedge it open to give the pierogi its shape. And when that step is finished, I let it sit out for a day or two, and then I'm going to fasten the planks right here to the sides. You can't find pierogues like this just anywhere. Only in the north of Suriname, in the region of the Saramaka tribes. People here don't have cars. The only way to ship things around is by boat. Anything that we have to transport goes by pirogue. That's why the villages are so close to the riverbanks. Before, the gold prospecting was my whole life. I hunted to eat, and I destroyed nature in the gold panning camps. Back then, I was a polluter. I didn't realize what nature could offer me. The Amazon is a boundless universe. It never ends. There is always something further ahead. You advance, and it keeps on going. Brocopondo Lake, a vast reservoir of fresh water, is an otherworldly landscape, a parcel of the sunken Amazon. In the 1960s, they built a dam on the Suriname River to provide electricity to the capital, Paramaribo, the bauxite mines, and in particular, an aluminum factory. Those are islands over there. They used to be hills. You have to imagine that this used to be a mountainous tropical landscape. With the dam, the water rose and submerged everything in the valleys, and the hills became islands. It's very mysterious, the trees underwater here. This has been a sunken forest for more than 60 years. Nature has stood still here in Brocopondo. When the tropical forest was submerged beneath fathoms of water, no one imagined that they were in fact sinking a treasure. 
Fabian has come to meet the men who are mining the rich vein of Brocopondo, a handful of intrepid Brazilians, all top-notch lumberjacks. If the water's clear, it's good. We can work. We can see what we're doing, but if it's murky, it gets tricky. Often, when you're down at the bottom and you're a little tired, your mind begins to drift, you get distracted. This is not good. You have to stay focused on your work and on the machine, because if you let your mind wander, you could lose an arm, you could lose a leg. The treasure of Brocopondo is down at the bottom of the lake. Mahogany, Angelique, Amaranth, millions of cubic meters of precious rare woods of the Amazon. As a general rule, logging trees here is not good for nature. But in this lake, you can just serve yourself. All the trees are dead. The tropical forest is as old as the world. We have to protect it. But here, the wood has been underwater for a long time. It's not your ordinary lumberjack who can work in these extreme conditions. He has to handle the chainsaw underwater while breathing through an air hose connected to the compressor. Tamu, the Brazilian, has arrived at the base of the tree 20 meters down. The long immersion in the water has made the wood rot-proof and of a very high quality, as hard as rock, which makes it so valuable. The lumber from Brocopondo is some of the world's most expensive wood. The lumberjacks have worked for the next 20 years, logging the sunken treasure of the Amazon. I'm an adventurer. I love going into the forest, being there. I really enjoy it. It makes me happy. Adventure, adventure, and more adventure. When I was young, there was the, the Siri Flying Doctors. I think it's a very old Siri from the 70s or the 80s. The nurses or the doctors take a, take a plane to, to save the patients. And we always uh, watch that Siri. And um, I already knew I wanted to become a doctor. Uh, I always wanted to become a doctor. My father is a doctor. And uh, I really like the Siri. So now it's, um, yeah, it's like Flying Doctor. And I think this is uh, pretty close to, to my dream. I'm the flying doctor. Africa is 
as a Tehron. I deliver everything. <laughs> the post, sometimes um, rice for the people who work here. But now we don't have, but uh, yeah, we, we take everything. For the tribes of the Amazon, the doctor always arrives by air and never empty-handed. Rosanne Percher, 35, is Suriname's only flying doctor. She works for Medische Zending, a medical and humanitarian mission. She crisscrosses the Amazon by plane, helping the communities isolated in the vast tropical forest. Well, I did my specialization in tropical medicine, and for that I went to Ethiopia. Um, and I always love traveling, so I've been to many countries in, in Africa. And I've been to India for a long time. Rosanne has always preferred field medicine to a comfortable consulting room in Amsterdam. This is her profession and her passion, and it has made her a kindly, generous person. Roseanne visits the village of Apetina on the shores of the Tapahoni River at least once a month. The village practical nurse is there to greet her. When a child has an attack, I treat him with a vaporizer. Now the parents have to know how to do it too. He doesn't like doctor. <laughs> He's been in the hospital too long. He doesn't like doctor. He went to the city by emergency. He's very ill. And now he came back and uh, luckily he's healthy again. But I, we see him every time we come here to check on him because uh, we want to know how he's doing. So he's, uh, it's my, my favorite kid in the village. <laughs> yeah. They're waiting for the doctor at the infirmary. With her portable ultrasound device, Roseanne can monitor the pregnancies of the future mothers here in the heart of the Amazon. Oh. Okay. I'm you love your baby already, right? Well, I'm going to show it to you and measure it. You wanted a boy? <laughs> you see those three lines on the screen? If it's a boy, there'll usually be two little balls and one line. We've just figured out that it's a girl. And now I'm looking for amniotic fluid. But I don't see much. It's not enough, she needs to go to the city. Uh, because she doesn't have a big belly. This young woman risks having problems in her late pregnancy. Roseanne has to persuade the parents that it would be better to go to the city for the last few weeks before the birth. Sometimes they don't go because they're just, they don't have um, a place to stay in the city, they don't have uh, funding, they, uh, they prefer staying with their families. So sometimes in these areas we have very difficult uh, labors because, uh, because of the people we advise to go to the city just stay here. And we understand that they stay here, but for us it's better if they go to the city. So she knows and she's going to talk with her family about it. Roseanne won't be back for a month. The only way this future mother can give birth in the city is with the doctor's plane. When the river is at its lowest, it takes weeks by pirogue to go from this village to the capital. For Roseanne and Andy, her pilot, the job means endless takeoffs and landings. Mm -hmm. 
Andy, also Dutch, gave up his real estate job in Europe to become a pilot for MAF, a Dutch association that uses its fleet of planes to help isolated communities the world over. So serving together with uh, Medis is ending, um, yeah, it's just a benefit for both because we do the flying, they do the ma uh, medical stuff, you know. And uh, so each of us are doing his, his job and uh, we both serve the people of Suriname for many, many years already. I think it's more than 50 years. Three-quarters of this little country's population lives in Paramaribo, the capital. This is where the headquarters of Medische Zending, Roseanne's medical mission, is located. This is um, this is my ultrasound, and this is just material. This moet ook leren. Material for the polyclinic for the patients, some medication, some equipment, and vaccine. Every time they set out, it's an expedition. The doctor's plane is not just a medical liaison; it's a veritable lifeline between the capital and the villages inland. So today's trip is going from Paramaribo to Kawamhaka. And then we stayed at Palimu and we went to Tepu the next day and back. The village of Kawamaka is an hour and a half from the capital in the region of Upper Maroni. This community of Wayana Indians lives in the region where Suriname meets French Guiana. This is where the borders start to become uncertain. No one ever comes here, apart from the illegal prospectors of the wildcat gold mines. Since the 1970s, Medische Zending has been training a practical nurse in each Amerindian village to dispense primary health care while waiting for the doctor to arrive, and also to make sure the patients follow up on their treatment. Hi, Meep. Meep, the village chief, is also Kawamaka's practical nurse. Some of the patients I see all all day, uh, all year, so I see them coming and going and coming and going. So when they come back, uh, I, we can chat. But sometimes it's very busy and we have we don't have the the time to really have this relationship, building up the relationship. But uh, some of the People, they are chronic patients, so I see them a lot. <laughs> As the practical nurse, Meep attends all Roseanne's consultations. Like all village chiefs, his words are respected and heeded. He's a very important person for this village and for the area, and he's a very good nurse, so he's my, uh, my support uh, in bad times. 
He can call me all the time. He calls me sometimes for accidents or other things happening. And uh, yeah, he knows what he's doing. So that's good. He's got his cabaret out. So I'm prescribing one pill per week, okay? Oh yes, you like to laugh, you. Roseanne has a two-year-old son and is expecting her second child. This has changed her status in the eyes of the Indian women. You see no slam, and you heard no slam. Is he banal? I'm five months pregnant, and um, well, now they sometimes they see, sometimes they don't but um, they like it very much because it makes me more a woman than a doctor. So uh, they, yeah, they think I'm more one of them than because I'm also pregnant and not a doctor who visits and goes back to the city. So, yeah. <laughs> This work gives me great pleasure and great energy, and um, so I keep active as long as I keep active. <laughs> I hope. Clary, say it. Lawa. The first time I came here, they were very shy because it's very shy people, very introvert people. But uh, as you come, as they see you come back and back and back, and they return, and you see, they see that you you take interest in their culture, in their families, in in their health. Then they open up a bit, and you can talk more about uh, life and family. Roseanne has just received an emergency call. She has to cut short her consultations to go help a young woman who's having problems in labor. It will be a 40-minute flight. So, now we have an ambulance I'm waiting for the doctor. If she is ready with the patients right now, we can go. Well, we have uh, two very sick patients in different places, different areas in Suriname. So uh, we're leaving here now and uh, going to fetch them. And there's an ambulance waiting uh, in Paramaribo to get them to the hospital. Where? It's a life and death situation, and Roseanne is in a race against time. She doesn't know anything about the mother or baby's condition. When they land, the village practical nurse fills her in. It seems that the baby is out of danger, but not the young mother. <laughs> Every year, they carry out 200 medical evacuations through the skies over the world's largest forest. Don't worry. You'll come back. You may need an operation, you know. Then you'll be able to come back. You'll have to be brave, okay? Okay. Okay. You want some water? Okay. It's time to go. Okay, If she wants to lie down, she can go over to the other side.
I think when you decide to become a doctor, you also want to help people. And in some countries, it's just um, your help is um, it's very useful. It's more useful than maybe in, in Holland. So that's why. And I think now we're here in uh, in the middle of the Amazons. They really appreciate my help. Here, the people just live day by day. They take life as it comes, and they they cherish it. And um, for me, that's very it's a very valuable lesson that you should always. Um, yeah, appreciate your day as it comes. I can c contribute more than maybe I could staying in Holland. And... Monique Poole is a heroine in her country because she is a defender of the Amazon's emblematic animal, the sloth. I, I, I think we humans are doing a lot of damage to, the, to nature, and I think this is the best thing we can do. We have to help these animals back into the wild where they can live. So I'm, I'm really glad to be sort of a taxi driver for uh, wildlife. They are a symbol for me of the vulnerability of nature and of uh, how important it is for us to protect nature and, and the animals in it. This animal always seems to be smiling and it has a charming, peaceful nature. Its incredibly slow pace is due to its diet. The sloth spends all its time digesting its food. Out in her yard, Monique is caring for a dozen sloths picked up from the center of Paramaribo. Then she releases them into their natural habitat. Thanks to her actions, she was shortlisted for CNN Hero of the Year. We started 10 years ago when um I lost a dog and I went looking for my dog and then um, I, I found a baby sloth and that's how um, I, I then became involved in learning what was happening to them, why were they in trouble. So when there is a, a problem, all the other animals can fly away or run away but they, they cannot. So they will stay in the tree until it gets uh, pushed over. Monique's yard is a little Noah's Ark, a haven for the more fragile creatures of the forest. She also shelters porcupines, anteaters, plus one giant anteater, vulnerable endangered species from Central and South America. Monique Poole's nickname is the Sloth Lady. Over the past 10 years, she has saved hundreds of animals. Little by little, a team of volunteers formed around her, and they created a foundation, Green Heritage Fund Suriname. She may not be a biologist, but she has become one of the world's foremost experts on sloths. We don't know enough about the populations. Only recently we found that this species that we have in Suriname, the tree-toed sloth, is only uh, limited to the Guyanas, to Brazil and Venezuela. Before, we thought it had a much larger range. And so we don't really know all that much. Here at the coast, we see a lot of animals. So we even don't know really what the distribution is. So that's why we're trying to do research on, on where they are, what they do, and we work together with all researchers in the area here.
Four years ago, Monique carried out her most memorable rescue. She had been alerted that about 10 animals were in the woods close to the city. But nothing went as planned. Monique filmed the whole sequence. If this was in 2012, and we rescued a lot of animals from a very small piece of land, only seven hectares, and there were really a lot of animals, uh, a lot of sloats, but almost 200 animals in seven hectares of land in the city. The operator was very nice because he was really looking for the trees not to fall down, but push them onto other trees so that the animals wouldn't be hurt. Two we found later were um, dead, but then most of them were um, just um, completely unharmed. Maybe scared, but uh, that was it. Monique also has another passion. About 40 kilometers up from the open sea, the estuary of the Suriname River is home to a rare endemic marine mammal. This morning I have a special meeting with nature and with the dolphins. They are right there. The Guiana dolphin is very difficult to observe. Twice a month, at dawn, Monique does a nose count of this little sedentary school of dolphins. For 10 years, we have been following the dolphins and trying to, uh, to see where they live, um, what they do during the day, and see what they eat, what affects them. They come, they look at you, um, then they go and do their business, they go and swim, and then sometimes they come. If they're very happy or want to show off a new baby, then the baby comes and shows itself. It's very special. This is, I think, in the whole of South America, a unique uh, river for this type of dolphin. Monique passes on her observations to French scientists studying the Guiana dolphins. They recognize the value of her work, even though she is not a scientist. Actually, since I was a little child, I always loved nature. I wanted to become a biologist, but then I studied something else. I studied languages. So this is like still my passion from being a child. Now to still be close to nature and be able to do something for nature. It's really uh, fantastic. SOS Sloths in Danger. Every week, Monique gets dozens of calls to pick up stray animals in the city, in yards or houses, all settings where the sloths can't survive. It's an emergency and the people are uh, worried about it, either maybe because they have dogs, maybe they have small children, and so they are maybe afraid. We will find out when we get there. So we were able to um, to catch him uh, after we agreed. <laughs> Yeah. After we agreed on how we would be doing it. So, I, because I know how they behave, so we were able to do it much faster than uh, before. Before I didn't really know, and now I know. So then it's easy to get them into the cage. 
This is a two-toed sloth, the biggest and feistiest when threatened. They're very likable animals. That's surely why Monique's work is so popular in this land of sloths. Today, Monique is going to set free the very healthy sloth they picked up in town. These animals do not belong in the city. Uh, we are encroaching on their habitat. So there's a human uh, animal conflict there. And the best thing we can do for them is to bring them to a forest of which we know that it's not going to be cut and where they can live for uh, many, many years. So every animal we get, if it's healthy, it will go back to the forest like this. She is, she knows, she's like, okay, open it, open it. <laughs> Huh? He's looking around eh, to see uh, what is his new home. So he's really uh, looking where's food, where is a good place to sleep, and where where can I stay safe? Well, this is his new home. He he comes from the city, so now he's back in the trees where he's, uh, he will be happy. This is the most amazing moment of every rescue because this is where they belong. And so within a few minutes, you're not able to see them, but you know they're there. You know, these little friends I have, that they are there, they're watching me. And it's just a fantastic uh, idea. This is where they belong. You can see their whole uh, face is changing, their energy. They, they love, this is, this is their home. So this is the best moment, the best moment of every, every animal that we get is when we can let it go back to the forest. Yeah. Monique has managed to buy a small parcel of Amazonian forest thanks to the Green Heritage Fund. She's planning to build a large refuge for sloths here in a few months when she has collected enough money in order to ease their return to the wild. What makes me uh, want to protect this is because it's, first of all, it's very beautiful. And I think we humans, we need beauty as well. And not just beauty from humans who make more beautiful things, but be the beauty of nature. And so that's why we need to preserve it, to be healthy humans. We need to have forests like this that regenerate us and give us uh, uh, energy. Monique came here to feel the pulse of the forest atop the Volzberg Dome. Someday, she'll write her story. The story of a woman in love with the sweetest and gentlest of animals, the Amazonian sloth. You just feel at peace here, just complete uh, at ease. This is where we belong, I think. This is, this is, the most beautiful place in the world, I think. Oh, yeah. 
be the 